Arabs are the weeds of the world and they keep coming back. They may not show all the time, but they keep coming back. Plants have always been with people and some people never realize that plants are here to heal. They'll never leave. You can't get rid of herbs. They're like people you learn from, they help you to get through the hard times and the bad times and come right back. You're going back to the basics, you're going back to the beginning. We have everything we need to heal ourselves. The salt from the sea, the clays from the earth, the minerals from the earth, and we just need to watch nature, watch the animals, uh, watch how they heal themselves when they have been hurt. And when we learn to respect nature more, we will go back to the beginning. And a lot of the social ills that are plaguing us now won't have as much of an impact once we start moving back to basics. be fish and taters every single day they used to sing and dance as they went along singing a happy but a teasing kind of song ha 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 yeah man Plants are always evolving themselves to survive. Just like people, you know, we're changing, but we're still moving forward. And that's what motivates them. Stress motivates them to live. So plants change and adapt according to their best chances. My name is Neville Richardson. Um, son of a grandson of a herbalist who's passed on now. I was fortunate because I lived near my granny and I basically, when I hit around my teenage years, I started hanging out on the wall, hanging with people because of my, my zeal and my earnesty to find truth. I hung with her generation and some people older than her because that generation, there's some individuals who weren't necessarily known to be herbalists or anything like that, but they they knew some things. So I guess I started learning before I understood that I was learning. I love these from everybody, basically. But one that was more of a teacher to me was my grandmother, Elizabeth Richardson, known as Lizzie. <laughs> you run into some people that have all different walks of life that she's touched in some way and showed them and helped to heal them. She walked about and talked about herbs. She kind of was one of those tree huggers. <laughs> People didn't understand at the time for a while, yes, it, as it usually goes. And my greatest thing was always back to scripture. So we learned to understand it with a reverence and some respect, which for me became more sacred than um, our religious order. My name is Connie Frith Black and I am what is known as a classical traditional naturopath. My practice entails using all things natural along with alternative complementary modalities. My concentration was herbology and so uh, the herbs have become one of my best friends. Herbs have personalities just like people and they are a very mysterious science. They keep me on the edge, always wanting more, always wanting to learn more. As a child growing up, I can specifically remember the match me if you can leaves being used to break my fever. 
and helped to ease my cold. The leaves being placed on my chest, they had been soaked in a solution, which I think was rubbing alcohol. And I can remember the brown paper being applied and I had a, an old shirt, uh, I think it was a sweatshirt. And under the covers, uh, and sweating, and sweating profusely. And uh, I can remember feeling better after that time, but my mom knew exactly how many leaves to apply, the duration that the leaves were to stay attached to my chest. And I remember the fever being broken. It wasn't unusual during my childhood to find people around the neighborhood uh, that practiced folk medicine. It was common, everyday conversation to hear someone talk about herbs or making herb tea of some kind. And so this is very much a part of my practice now, is going back to those old ways used by my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and passing it on. My name's Joanne Adams, and um, I actually work at Barclay Institute. Um, I'm the Director of Staff Development. I've been in education for a long time. I have been using herbs all my life for medicinal reasons and just because um, I enjoy some of the drinks that we can make from them. It's a family tradition. We used things like lemongrass and made drink out of it. It became your summer drink as opposed to Kool-Aid and things like that. And we used to mix things like Father John and mint and lemongrass together. So you have different mixtures that we would do as well. And we would just have them as a, a hot or cool drink. But I don't consider myself an herbalist. I just have a tradition that's been passed on through my family, from both sides of my family. My father's side, they're from Baylor's Bay area, and my mother's side, which is from the Somerset area. And there are differences in what people do with some of the herbs from one end of the island to the other, and, and names. Some of the things are called by different names as well. So I guess I have a mixture of both sides of the world in Bermuda space. <laughs> and um, I enjoy working with Bermudian culture. I love Bermuda, I love my country, and I'm glad that I can do something that I can share with other people. There's been a lot of plants introduced to Bermuda now where there are a lot more uses, a lot more useful plants which were brought here for horticultural reasons, but now we're finding great, great um, nutritional value and medicinal properties. My knowledge has expanded because I've always been close to Earth, so I look for those things. And I know a lot of what Bermuda has here has been passed on to us through our Native American heritage. So some of the things now, when I study, go to North America and I study the um, plants I've seen there, and I see them here, there are more things added to it. And I'm like, whoa, this is quite interesting. And you start to understand how people and plants connect and how plants were moved around the world. And then you meet Africans and you find if you have a plant that's similar or it's in the same family and it has similar traits or similar properties. And now we're finding because of research and because of the integration of people from other cultures in the country now, the way it is, you're finding so much uses and people are like, oh, there's a weeds and you find out there's some divine value in these things. And the early English explorers, European explorers, when they first started to go around on plant explorations, that's what they were really looking at, the medicinal stuff. It's easy to find information on herbs. It's not a hidden thing anymore. People are studying herbs, so with people understanding more, you find we have more and more to offer because of our diverse um, plant life here. The American Botanical Society has a website that you can go on and they are forever posting new developments in herbal medicine and then you have the Royal Botanical Society in the UK and the Germans are very big on herbal medicines, uh, homeopathic medicines. So there are a number of societies out there that are documenting the medicinal properties and applications of herbs so that we can continue to use them. 
them safely. They are developing new medicines with plants faster than we can learn them. Um, there are so many coming out on a regular basis. So there's a tremendous amount of research that goes into my practice as well. I have to keep on top of the herbs that are out there and how modern science is now moving toward using these plant medicines because they are finding that they are less invasive, that they are getting better results. And uh, a lot of that is not public knowledge. Sometimes I go and speak in social studies classes on Bermudian culture and um, I ask them who knows anything about any of the herbs and they don't know about a lot of them but almost everybody has had some sort of an experience with something so then they can share with each other. One day a young man came in and said, how come we don't learn all these things? We need to know about X, Y, and Z. And I said, oh, I have a book over there about that. And I pointed to my book on my bookshelf and well, my book to be, <laughs> my binder. And um, he said, wow, well, how come you don't teach a course in this? I said, well, we just don't do it, but if you come by, I'll be happy to share it with you, you know. So I think they still have an interest. It's just how you get it to them and when, and because I still think a lot of things are used. And I've actually been in the pharmacy and heard people asking, where can you find stinging nettles? There aren't any stinging nettles hardly around anymore. My child's got chicken pox. I need stinging nettles to bathe them in. And you know, you make the tea from that and you bathe somebody in, in the stinging nettle tea and it helps to dry off the chicken pox. But stinging nettles, I don't see like I used to, that's certain. With all the manicuring of lawns and whatnot, a lot of the things that grow in the grass, you don't see as frequently as you used to but it depends on where you go as well. Back some years ago, when I had a class, I actually, one of the things I did is go through the tracks. We did a trail walk looking for certain things. And because it's still a lot of untouched land through some of the tracks and tribe roads, you can find lots of things. So, you know, it's wonderful that people still do that. First of all, I'm going to say welcome to Spittle Pool and everybody's backyard in this area. Right here on my right is what we call goldenrod, seaside goldenrod. This is a plant that grows on the coast in Bermuda. It has a beautiful golden flower on it. This goldenrod is really good for allergies. You make a tea from the flower and that helps to break like upper respiratory allergies. They do the tea while it's yellow and the flowers are fresh or you take it and cure it and use it while it's green and it becomes more of a tonic and it becomes more preventative. The roots are used also for um, kidney and liver conditions. The leaves, again, they can be used to help allergies. Here we are, not too far from the goldenrod is the flopper or people call life plant. In this form now, you notice the leaf is very small. Some people know it when it has a real large leaf on it. And then it has a pretty flower that you can use in floral arranging even, right? And you actually take the juice from this. You could actually chew it up in your mouth, get it all mushy. And then if you have insect bites, you could squeeze that on it. Or if you have a cold, you could take from five to seven of these leaves, make a concoction out of it to drink. And every three hours, you take a little bit of this and it will help to break down a cough. And if you got cold and stuff, it really works. If you have an injury, like you cut yourself or whatever, or you got some rash, same thing, but you put it on as a poultice, clean you up soon. And it's soothing. It's a succulent, so it's a near cousin to cactus. So it has that um, nice mucilage in it. It's called the life plant. This is apple mint. This is one of my favorite mints. If you pull one of the leaves and you tear, you can smell that minty apple aroma. This is great for making iced tea in the summer, mint tea. When sweetening teas, I would advise that you use natural sweeteners. If you have stevia or agave, the organic cane juice or cane crystals, honey, because they don't go through a chemical process and you will get more flavor from the herbs. 
to make your tea a little decorative, you can actually take uh, the mint flowers and you can put them in your ice trays and allow them to freeze. So you have something really decorative and natural. So I use the flowers of the herbs as well. Lots of times I have salads and people are like, mm, what, what, what is that in there? And I say, oh, that's a flower off of whatever. And they go, hmm, I didn't know you could eat this. <laughs> So yes, you can eat the flowers. Mint is very good for colds and sinus. It opens up the sinuses. Very good for making an herbal bath. You can use um, dried mint leaves or fresh mint leaves in an herbal bath. You can use lemon balm in an herbal bath with lemongrass, particularly if you have any type of skin rash. You can use the combination of, of lemongrass, lemon balm, and perhaps a mint and that will soothe any skin irritation uh, that is going on. This is cough grass. Some people I've heard call it carpenter grass in other countries. It has a little purplish sort of color, light purpley white flower that comes on it and it's good for curls and coughs. I guess hence the name cough grass. This right here is periwinkle. It's also known as poor man's rose. And um, there are a couple of different species of periwinkle. So please note the right one to use because if you look just over a little further, there's another white one and that white one has the red center. You do not want to use the one with the red center, but the one we showed you initially. The white one with the sort of yellow center is actually the one that you would use to boil the leaves or the flowers and make tea. It's good for diabetes to bring your sugar levels down to the where they should be. And it's also really good for high blood pressure. Here in the garden, we have a pawpaw tree. Young pawpaws have a great value for blood pressure. If you take and boil pawpaws, skin them and, and boil them, you can use the um, water for high blood pressure. So those are the types of things that I would go and get things for. This is the pawpaw or papaya plant. The black seeds of the ripe papaya are very good for expelling worms and the enzymes from the fruit are very good for any type of digestive issue, uh, for any gas, for any bloating, uh, for uh, irritable bowel or any, any type of um, gastrointestinal disorder. And you can take the young leaves of the papaya or papaw tree and steam them like spinach. They are edible as well. So these are young plants and I will separate them and plant them individually as they grow to a certain height. And I will put them in a happy place and they will produce fruit. <laughs> and the green pawpaw is used for blood pressure. Our parents and grandparents would be a lot more familiar with that. They would drink the water. Uh, they would also take the green pawpaw and pulverize it and make a poultice for any type of ulcers on the skin. <laughs> There's so much to remember. I, <laughs> I think I'm a walking encyclopedia sometimes. I just have to press a button and, and it all spills out. Here we have the green banana. The leaf sometimes can be used in cooking, like to wrap food in. And as a medicinal plant, rather than just for the fruit, if you take the fruit of the green banana and you cut it when it's green, the sap that comes off it, if you put it onto warts or some skin disorders, it would actually work to dry them off and kill the germ. And then the wart itself would drop off eventually and hence you'll be pretty good after that. This plant that we're going to look at next is cochineal, right? The cochineal is named cochineal after the insect that creates this little brown spot, this brown mass that you see on it is actually an insect. What happens with this one? If you break your leaf off, then you cut the little spines off, put it in water, let it soak for a while, you could drink that, and it's good for your kidney, your liver, and therefore the condition of your, your body. 
especially during the summertime and if you have inflammation of your spine, inflammation of any of your joints, this is the guy that would help. Teenagers with pimples, acne, this is one that would help you a lot. It's a good summer drink. And right next to that, just below it is aloe vera, which is a lot stronger and used like an astringent. It's more astringent than regular cacti. Aloe has many, many properties that heal. I've known people to take aloe vera, take the flash order of the center and chop it up with grated beet and eat their mornings as a blood purifier and a cleanser. And it flushes them. Flushes them gently through sweating and urinating. You can use this for skin irritation sometimes or just as a conditioner. It's nice to make shampoos out of her rinse. Cochineal is also good as a hair rinse and it helps you pull the lint and stuff out of your hair, condition your scalp. It makes a good conditioner for your growth of your hair. Where did I see rosemary over here? There's a few things over here. When I was young, my granny always put a sprig of rosemary in her little blue bergamot grease, <laughs> hair grease. She used to say it's good for your hair and it strengthens your hair. And as I grew up, I started boiling it and putting it in a bottle. Initially, it looks sort of a greeny color and then it darkens over time. And it keeps your hair dark and it gives your hair a glisten. And just every day, put a little bit in your hair. It helps strengthen it and also helps keep the color in the hair. It's also supposed to keep you from going bald or help your hair to grow back. And I had luck with somebody who did that once and they were so excited because they had longer hair than they ever had. A few strands on the crown of their head. And then he thought that was wonderful because he had never seen hair up there before. <laughs> Rosemary is also used for cooking purposes and is especially good with bringing out the taste in lamb. Right here we have sage. Another very strong herb. In the old days, prior to toothbrushes, it was actually used to clean your teeth. And if you see the roughness of it, um, and it leaves a nice scent in your mouth as well, so you would be fresh. So if you're ever out somewhere and you need to freshen up, because you see a special someone coming down the street, you might want to chew on a sage leaf. It's also used medicinally for women. It helps to soothe menstrual cramps and other female issues. You can actually take the leaf of the sage and boil it and make tea, but there are many types of sages, so you need to ensure that this is the one that you get. It's the one with this purplish sort of flower on it. Now, some people say you only should do herbs in odd numbers and that you should use three or five or seven. You never use even numbers. I don't know where that came from. I use whatever I feel like at the time and I don't count the different ones I put in. But that's just different traditions that come from different people and it could be from different parts of the island. It could be influenced from family members um, who have come from other countries. So it's so many things that impact on how we use things. Anybody ever tell you they used to take hibiscus flour and clean our school shoes? So by the time we got home, if they was dirty, they would be clean, you wouldn't get in trouble. And if you took a cloth and buffed it like that, it worked like polish. Yeah, I used to do it. <laughs> this is fennel. I've heard people say it's almost extinct. It's not. Fennel would never leave us. Look at the leaf, how it is. It's like your, your veins, how they would go out into your body. The seed is good and the stem. They're good for cooling the blood, so it helps to purify your blood. If you dry the two, you can use them throughout the year because they preserve well. If you mix this with ginger, it makes a nice drink and helps your metabolism to come up if it needs to come up or neutralize if it needs to. And it's nice in drinks. So if you want a sweet drink of some taste to it, you can use a bit of fennel and it makes that herb tea that tastes bitter or bland, it makes it a bit more exciting. I remember one time I had fennel, a doctor bee stung me. And I ran right to the fennel, grabbed the fennel and put it on the sting. No swelling, the pain went. I think that's one thing that really shocked me up too. That made me like, ah, this works. And here we have the Suriname cherry tree. These normally produce fruit twice a year in the spring and again in early fall around September. The leaves can be used in conjunction with lemongrass for colds and fevers. 
in folklore, branches of the Suriname cherry are used as insect repellents, repelling flies and mosquitoes, also as a natural air freshener. And the deeper realms of folklore say that the leaves are also very good for repelling negativity or evil spirits. And here we just have some common garden herbs. This is a West Indian thyme. And there's a definite difference between the color and the texture. This thyme is a lot stronger than your common garden thyme. This is Thai basil, used a lot in Thai foods. And here we have some tarragon. It's hiding there. This is a pesto basil variegated leaf. And I got that at one of the local plant nurseries. And I use a natural insect repellent uh, called diaper dust. And uh, it's made from plants that repel uh, insects. And marigolds also repel insects and that's why I plant them in the garden among the herbs and these are my salad greens I keep a container of mixed salad greens in the herb garden so that I can come out and just clip the leaves and have my fresh salads oh look Parsley. This is parsley when it gets matured and it's about to become a mummy. So parsley has become full of seed, just like the fennel. It has seed heads. The seeds are nutritious also. But what we usually do is use these seeds in garnishes, in tea sometimes. The foliage, you can be eating them as salads rather than eating them like a garnish. So if you cut them up and use them in your salads more, you find more benefit. Parsley is real good for your system. I'm not going to tell you too much about parsley because I want you all to go in and start trying it and you can come back to one another and share the good news with one another. Parsley is nice. We have the saying, let your food be your medicine and let your medicine be your food. That has so gone out of the window in today's world. With the advent of fast food chains all over, fast food, people not having the time or taking the time to prepare meals, saying it's more cost effective to eat fast foods. I've done that research and it's a load of rubbish. There is no way you're going to convince me that spending money for fast food every day is cheaper than going to the farmer's market or the grocery store and buying fresh produce and preparing meals from scratch. You don't have to spend hours in the kitchen. Healthy meals can be prepared in a half hour and it is actually cheaper. I've had Christmas where everything on my table was fresh. The eggs were from our chickens and the vegetables were from my garden. So I make ginger beer and sorrel. That's a traditional Christmas drink in the Caribbean. And that's what I use for gifts. And people really enjoy getting them. I cook from scratch and as much as possible get fresh fruits and vegetables and eggs. I support my local farmers when I didn't have it in my yard myself. And I take pride in serving things that come out of my yard. And um, you know, I think those are important things and that we need to pass those things on to our children because if you don't show your children how to do them or somebody does not go in the kitchen to do them, um, nobody grows them in the yard. We will lose those things which are inherent in our culture. The only way to maintain culture is to pass it on. So we should know our traditions. I feel passionate about that, that we maintain these things, you know. Auntie so-and-so makes 20 pies for everybody in the family. So when auntie's gone, who's left to make farine or cassava pie anymore? You know, fruitcake and Christmas pudding and making the herb teas. So I think it's just important that we try to um, capture it and, and keep it because it's, it's just part of being Bermudian.
these are the Suriname cherry leaves and I'm going to just pick some of them for the tea. I prefer the young ones, the small ones. I find that they have the most smell to them. The larger ones tend not to have the same smell as these ones, as the younger ones. In order to really smell the cherry leaves, I find that I have to crush them up and that tends to release the scent of the cherry. Just bruise it a little bit. And there we go. My name is Zarina Codrington. I was Dr. Connie Frith Black's apprentice for the Community and Cultural Affairs Apprenticeship Program. Um, she had us learning about the traditional or medicinal uses of local plants and herbs. Here's our herbs, and now we're gonna make a tea from these herbs. We're going to use ginger, lemongrass, and the cherry leaves. My dad was always in the kitchen mixing up some sort of tea. Um, I have an aunt from Jamaica and she was always using some sort of plant or herb in her cooking. So um, I've grown up with it around me and I decided to take it to the next level for multiple reasons. One reason would be that I'm a parent, I'm a mother, and it's not all the time I want to be running to the doctor um, trying to get some sort of treatment for my children. If there is an easier way that doesn't involve me having to pay out of my pocket significantly, then I will take advantage of it. Additionally, it's a part of our culture, it's a part of our heritage, so it's a part of me. All right, so now we're going to add water to our pot. We're gonna let this water boil and then add our herbs to it. So the method I was taught to prepare tea is to bring the water to a boil and let it rest for about five minutes and then add the herbs and let them steep for a while. And then we strain the herbs and sweeten if necessary. So that's what we're gonna do right now. This is actually a syrup that I made using canned sugar and water. So it will be one cup of canned sugar to one cup of water. Just let it boil down and it turns into a liquid syrup. So I would add that to the tea. And because I don't really like sweetener, I tend not to sweeten the tea. Um, everybody can sweeten their own individual cups accordingly. My son is 15 and I have two daughters, ages 8 and 4. I still get the questions, can we have this? But my 15 year old seems to understand, so it's a lot easier to transition with him. The younger ones, they really don't have any choice, so yeah. So now we're going to turn off the water because it's boiling. We're gonna leave that off for about five minutes. And it's not really as bad as it might seem. They already understand certain things about their health and how eating and drinking certain drinks makes them feel better. So they already have that knowledge and they also like the herbs, so that's a, a bonus also. All right. So we've had our water off for about five minutes and now we're gonna add our herbs and let them sit for some time. We don't want to damage the delicate leaves of the plants that we have used, so it's just um, more sensitive to the plants. Our tea has been sitting and we're going to pour it into our pitcher. And my strainer is on top to catch any leaves which might fall. Ah, yeah, it could get a bit messy, but it's all good. 
And the first thing I smell is the ginger. Even though we didn't use a lot of ginger, the ginger is so fragrant. The smell really comes out. Now what I would do after this is to just let it sit and cool a little bit more. And I'll give this to my children. I get the little reusable bottles and I just fill it up with the tea, nice and cool for them, to their desired sweetness, which is a lot sweeter than how I would you know, normally like it. Um, and just send them off like that. And that's their juice for the day, um, using fresh herbs and ginger. And it works. It's a lot healthier than the juice boxes. I'm going to pour it into this glass. And here's my syrup. And what's nice about this syrup is that you can add your own flavor to it. You know, you can make it orange syrup if you want, adding some orange essence or mint syrup, adding some mint leaves to it. And I actually added some lemon to it, just a little squirt of lemon. So that works. And you can drink this hot or cold. Um, and there we go. Tastes really nice. It really does. <laughs> the ginger is, is there, but you know, I can still taste the lemongrass. It's really, really a good tea. Very nice. And just a little bit of sweetener for myself, for my preferences. And that's what just makes it all right. My head is always on the ground looking for the plants or the herbs that you know we think are weeds and I'm noticing them and if I don't know what it is I tend to keep an eye out for it to see if I see it in another environment to see if I see it with somebody else who might be able to tell me what it is so that's one major thing that's changed I'm also more keen on passing the information on to my children so even when we are walking I will identify plants for them so that they are aware of what they are. Um, so those are two ways that, um, that I've made some small changes in my life. And I tend to lean more to making my own um, foods, especially for my children. And using fresh herbs has made a complete difference in the taste of the foods. It's made me more adventurous, a little bit more courageous with my cooking using herbs. I will experiment more. Um, and if it's a bust, then I just move on. If it's a win, then I make notes and do it again. So it satisfies the children. It has a lot of taste and flavor to it and cost effective and tasty. There is still a lot of suspicion attached to alternative complementary modalities. There's still a lot of suspicion attached to folk practice. And still you get people that very strongly believe that these types of modalities are satanically influenced. But there's a lot of hesitancy, uh, a lot of superstition. And this is unfortunate because this was and still is the first medicine. Modern science has certainly taken healing to another level. And I do not exclude them in any way, shape or form because if I'm having a heart attack, I don't want a naturopath like me. I want a cardiologist. <laughs> I want to be able to go and have my heart properly checked out proper diagnosis. Um, there are things that I know that I can do from a natural perspective to complement that. Uh, but certainly I'm not going to mess around with trying to treat myself naturally, uh, having heart disease. But so many times you can actually benefit uh, in terms of prevention for a lot of illnesses by using natural applications. I don't like taking a lot of medication, and my children are definitely in that vein. They will not take medication unless they are right on and out. When you hear the commercials on TV, it's why would I even take that if it's gonna cause me to have all those other things? And um, you know, one of my brothers is actually selling herbal teas and teas for specific ailments. So although he didn't do it when he was younger, it was obviously passed on, but it was just a little later in life before they took it on. 
It's something I learned about as a youngster and I just kept with it and it's a way of life for me. It's just something I do. Did it skip a generation? Sort of did. Because my uncles and aunties said, oh, you ever listen to Granny's Voodoo? I used to be sitting there with a notebook, like taking nicks, and sitting in for hours, like, you know, and just like, hey. But they saw how serious I was, I just hang in there and learn more. And there is another movement coming up and taking over where it's, it's become commercialized and it may lose its essence. Because the greatest threat to this as a practice would be the fact that this is a thing you don't have to go to school for. And today most people are crying, you know, for health and safety and regulation. And it's hard to regulate something that's wild. But there's laws that are prohibiting some from being used because they're finding people overdosing or taking um, the wrong plant itself because they'll mix it up with another one. So, laws into everything nowadays, even the bushes. <laughs> and there's a divine order to it, so it's hard to encase it, it's hard to corral it. So there's an argument about how far do we go to certify this thing. It's an environmental awareness. It's not something you can, like you say, you can't cage it, you can't control it. it. It's a consciousness that you have to have and it's knowledge. So you learn how to be flexible. As far as us losing the practice of folk medicine here in Bermuda, it definitely is more practiced and discussed with our older population, with our senior population. Certainly the younger people my generation and the generations behind me. We come from an instant gratification platform. I want what I want and I want it now. I don't want to be sick, I want to take this pill, I, you know, I want to take this antibiotic. And so the younger generations tend to use pharmaceuticals more because they get quicker results. Herbs have what is known as a cumulative effect, so they take a while to get into the system and to gently work with the system. And so you have a less invasive approach and less side effects. So many people suffer with side effects because you take one pill and you get a side effect and so you take another pill to counter that side effect and it's a vicious cycle, it can become a vicious cycle. So we are suffering as a society in terms of our so-called advancement and using modern technologies. Uh, it has weakened us, and I think it has certainly made us more vulnerable, more susceptible to disease. But with so many indigenous peoples using various methods of plant medicine, bringing all of these applications of medicine together, our community have benefited. Doing the apprenticeship helped me solidify my perspective on certain things. I'm very wary of corporations making us think that, you know, we don't have the answers or the answers don't lie in nature when, you know, for the most part, we can't find an answer in nature. It'd just be a different result, you know, it might take a little bit longer, but there are alternatives to the quote-unquote normal way of doing things. Hi, have fun. This is all about trial and error. You know, I think I'm doing one thing the correct way and then someone else comes along and says, I should try a different way. Advice is always welcome though, because I want to learn. And what I've actually found is that I'm able to have more dialogue with certain people in my family, just in a way of passing on information. So yeah, it all kind of fell into place for me. People ask me all the time if I would make the herb tea and why don't I make it and sell it. And I never thought of them as herbal teas until they started putting them on the market. And other people say, well, you could bottle it and make money. And, but I don't want that commitment. When I feel like making it, I make it. And when I feel like making lots of it, I make lots of it. But I've never really thought about the marketing side of it because that takes you into a whole nother realm because, okay, it's fine for me to say, go out there and gather up some herbs and put them in a pot, but quantities, that's a whole science within itself. How do you tell people how to measure? Because I don't measure when I cook. <laughs> when my daughter calls home from overseas and says, well, mommy, how do you do Johnny bread? I have to go in my kitchen and actually make Johnny bread and put things in measuring cups and spoons to try and figure out 
quantities to tell her and then break it down so she doesn't have the well, quantity that I have for one person. It's the same way with the herbs for me. I just got a handful of this, a handful of that, two leaves of this, five leaves of that, because that's the taste I want. And I started thinking about, okay, if you put out a book and you want to tell people what to do, you start needing quantities because they're gonna, that's the first thing they want to know. Well, how much of this? So that to me is another whole scientific side of it that I don't know that I want to delve into and don't know who can help me to do that. You just don't do it like that. That's not how it's done. It takes away then from the traditional side of it, I guess. It, it moves it into a whole another area. Um, and I don't know how to move there or if I personally want to move there. I think Bermudians are becoming more receptive to natural modalities. And I think as they become more open, they will use these practices in their daily lives. Certainly we've seen that with the apprenticeship program, having the class change the diet, literally, of their children, taking away junk foods and preparing healthier meals, doing a bit more research on how to use herbs with childhood diseases. So yes, I would say we are becoming more open-minded. I never pushed nothing on nobody, but the first time I noticed it was the first Good Friday. Everybody was flying kites, playing football. My oldest one was running around, picking up dandelions, and he loves dandelions, his favorite flower. So he picks up dandelions and just... He picks them, even today he picks them and he blows them, and then I showed him how we can grow them. He took them and put them in the garden, and they grew big leaves. He's like, oh, let's eat them, and we eat them for salads and stuff, you know, so... As they come to realization of, like, what Earth really is about, there's less skepticism, but more interest in actually knowing, you know. It's all about goodness and what the earth is and the companionship between plants and humans. My children are very aware of it as well. Not as much as me, perhaps, but they're aware of many of the different things that we use. They make the teas as well. And I can remember I would be walking along in the summer and say, oh, it's hot, and I'll take a match me if you can leaf and put it underneath my hat because it's, if you take a match me if you can leaf and just rest it against your skin, it's very cool to the touch. And they would always laugh and say, oh, mommy, don't do that. And I remember once one of my girls said, it's hot, and we were by the beach, and she took one and she put it on. I said, oh, you're not laughing at me today, are you? <laughs> But they drink the teas and they know several of the different herbs and hopefully somebody may take it further. It started with herbs, like, you know, healing yourself. Because we're afraid of dying, people are afraid of being sick. And we found out just experimenting with certain foods, common foods that your parents give you, if you felt more energy or not. And then we notice it worked. Say, hey, look, this is serious, like, you know, me getting into this. And then we started to find out more and more about the benefits physically through the experiences. And as time went on, we started to handle those things differently and find even greater benefits. So it helped us to refine our diets more, helped us to um, not eat just for the sake of eating, just filling yourself because you like the taste or because you're hungry, but for the reasons of how you felt and what you knew it was doing for yourself. So you learn how to fuel ourselves with what we eat. Unfortunately, as time went on, we lost the knowledge of looking after plants um, and looking after ourselves. But um, as we go forward now, the knowledge gets more and more accessible. And I think that it's just something that awakens in some people. Some people much older, some people very young. And it goes across all types of nations. And it's more sacred than it is um, just a novel thing. They almost killed me, took my garden from me, drive me foolish. <laughs> I need my garden. What I'm doing is actually growing all the seed along here. You got corn here for seed, eggplant for seed, cauliflower for seed, cabbage here for seed, onions and chives and stuff like that for seed. And so when the seed comes forward, it reproduces a plant that's used to the stress that these plants have dealt with. Once the plants get out there and growing, they end up producing seed, seed get in the ground and then it comes back naturally. And what you end up having is a gill of useful weeds in your house. So it's a good idea you just minimize your efforts 
and use herbs for weeds to take over. And let the herbs take over with the weeds and then the weeds will fade out and the herbs will take over and you'll be all right. Many, many years ago, they used to sing and dance all the way from Somerset to St. Jude. They used to sing and dance as they went along, singing a happy but a teasing kind of song what they singing, man. They go like all the way from Mangrove Bay That's where all the old maids stay All the way to crawl inside her. Nothing there but foolish pride What you say? point half a gallon and half a pint all the way to Devonshire Point brackish water and rotten corn man you say that's funny man they used to sing and dance as they went along yes singing a happy but a teasing kind of song. Ah oh, ha ha, yeah man. All the way to Bayless Bay, fish and taters every single day.